Hello, Zonda. Hello, Kevin. One of the things that we deal with all the time when we're uh, working on conscious guidance and control, either on working on ourselves or working with other people, is that you constantly come out, coming up across things that are where you see that you're wrong or something's wrong. So how do we deal with the stimulus of being wrong? And then if you're in a lesson and the teacher might tell you you're doing wrong, what's the best way to deal with the with this stimulus? Because it's quite a big stimulus when someone tells you something as intimate as your own movements and your own thinking is, is wrong. Yes, yes, this is, uh, this is a basic question. This is a basic question. And uh, um, I have, I've started this year with this idea of um, uh, what's happened during the lesson, how do you deal with it? And uh, it's not a new subject. Uh, the subject has been treated by Alexander. Uh, dealing with what is wrong is uh, very often a very good indicator to know if a person is in communication with uh, uh, his reason or not. Uh, depending on how the person reacts to the stimulus. But that has to be uh, taken into account and clearly understood by both the teacher and the pupil. So, because there are, there, there are many somatic teachers that um, make everything they can in order to put the pupil at ease and uh, never, never say that something is wrong because that, well, this is too strong a stimulus. Um, this is not my way and uh, uh, it's because it's it, it's informed by what Alexander was was discussing when he when he took that subject to the fore, and so that's what I want to discuss today. So let's share the, my screen, and uh, we will start with this sentence. Um, uh, he's discussing exactly this problem. He says that naturally, a teacher is forced to point out at the beginning that this or that is wrong. All too frequently, the pupil at once shows distinct signs of unnecessary apprehension. And this condition is the most retarding feature in any teaching work. I have for years, in my own work, devoted special attention to it and uh, at once make an attempt to prevent it by endeavoring to put the pupil into communication with his reason. These are numerous and widely different means to this end in the early stage stages of re-education, to the description of which a whole book might easily be devoted, but it is sufficient here to mention it in a general way. So uh, to start well, this year, good resolution, you know, people have uh, intention of getting better. So when you have an intention to getting better is because you have, uh, well, you have noticed that something is not quite uh, right or is not um, uh, ev evolving in the way you want. You're getting a bit fat, you're getting a bit sluggish, you're, you're a bit slow uh, and, and you make new intentions. Well, um, in the Alexander Technique, as I teach it, it's exactly the same. Uh, it's necessary to, well, at first be told uh, what, is, um, uh, what is wrong. And, uh, well, it's absolutely uh, clear that my job is to tell my pupil as uh, simply as possible and as um, clearly as possible what is wrong. And Alexander has said that this, or that is wrong. And uh, this statement is maybe uh, a bit getting in the, right, in the wrong direction because uh, we are not interested in this or that. We are interested in this and that. So how do you, how do you know that a pupil, when you are an Alexander teacher like I am, how do I know that a pupil is showing distinct signs of unnecessary apprehension? Well, um, in this particular teaching style, we know a pupil is showing distinct signs of unnecessary appreciation because the pupil is reacting to the first mention of something, some this or that is wrong. We, I never tell people that this or that is wrong. 
only. It's not uh, the idea. Um, if the pupil reacts to that being wrong or this being wrong, it will react immediately without uh, reasoning out uh, the movements of the different parts of the, of the structure. And so we will see a very, an isolated adjustment that the pupil is making. So releasing, for if you say, for example, you're lifting your shoulders, uh, the pupil will try and release the shoulders down, uh, not realizing, as if he was in communication with his reason, not realizing that, um, in fact, there are different causes that are all coordinated together to produce the symptom of what is wrong. So um, it's the most retarding feature in any teaching work, uh, but particularly when you teach coordination of movements, because uh, when you show something that is not appropriate, and uh, for example, I've got uh, some example that I've taken from our last conversation about the straight neck or straight spine model. And um, you will find there are three different teachers here. And uh, w w what we can see is that, uh, well, they manifest the straight spine model or the straight neck model. It's absolutely obvious that the, the lower sternum, the lower part of the sternum bone, uh, the front of the rib cage, the middle part of the torso, is very far forward of the head. There is a distinct retraction of all the cervical spine because the upper thoracic spine is sent backward relatively to the middle thoracic spine. So uh, as a result, we see an inclined sternum in all cases. The inclined sternum is there and uh, we will see different aspects of the wrong use. We will see that for reaching up with the hand, uh, you see they are all lifting the shoulders. It's the same, it's a symptom of the same coordination of the different parts of the torso. It's not something isolated that the, pu that the teacher is doing or not doing at certain moment. You could say that at a, a different moment, the teacher could do something else. In fact, it is not the case. Uh, the, the neck muscles that are joining the shoulder with the head, in all cases, are very, very short, very tight. So you can say that as soon as the pupil, even if the teacher is just using the fingers, and touching lightly with the fingers. We see that lifting the fingers has led to lift the elbow and led to lift the shoulder near the ear. Uh, this is um, a symptom of an incorrect coordination of the different parts of the torso. This is not because the person is just lifting the hand. It's the, the person is lifting the hand with the middle torso very, very far off the upper torso. As a result, the upper thoracic spine is, is, is really thrown backward in space and the cervical spine and the chin and head are retracted. So uh, these are all symptoms of the same incorrect coordination of the different movements of the parts of the torso. So when I tell uh, somebody uh, that there is something wrong, I tend to uh, not stop at that. And uh, what is fundamental is in this uh, endeavor to put people into communication with their reason is to give them something to reason about. Uh, saying that one shoulder is too high does not help to reason. Well, saying that the shoulder is very far forward of the middle sternum uh, starts to be a better indication because then the person can start to realize that, uh, of course, like, let's look at another example. Uh, we have here a person with a straight neck. Okay, and uh, what we see is that the sternum bone is very much inclined backward. I requested the pupil to touch the lower sternum with the index of the right hand that I'm showing here. And I requested the pupil to, uh, in front of the camera, just uh, uh, realize where the top of the sternum was. 
you would wonder, but when I ask the person to uh, answer the question, which finger is forward of the other when you're standing? Is it the index finger of the left hand that is touching the top of the sternum, or is it the index of the right hand that is touching the lower sternum? And curiously, the person was not aware of the reality. The person had an answer. This answer was somatic, which means an answer that is guided by what the person feel. And what the person felt was that uh, the top of the sternum was further forward than the lower part of the sternum. When you look at the image, it's difficult to, to, to accept an answer like this. Of why is she answering that the top of the sternum is further forward? So my job is not to stop at this. My job is to start to explain that uh, the neck position and the retraction of the neck and the shoulders that are lifted. Look at how the shoulders are because I asked the person to lift a finger. In order to lift the finger, the person is lifting the shoulder. The shoulder, the, the top of the upper arm, the upper part of the arm is higher than the top of the sternum. So in this case, you must say that no matter what the person feels, then the neck is not free. The neck is very short. The muscles that are attaching the, the shoulder to the head are very short for the shoulder to be higher than the thoracic cage. So we find here that there are symptoms, but the symptoms of the chin being very far back from the lower sternum vertical just tell us that the person is organizing the movement of the lower torso, middle torso and upper torso in standing in an incorrect way. So uh, you could say, well, having the top of the sternum so far back is wrong. But that is not helpful to, to help the pupil come into communication with a reason. To help come into communication with a reason, I must give her or the pupil, I must give the pupil indications on how the movements are coordinated together. So uh, saying that the pupil, uh, for example, is, uh, is shortening the chin is n of no use unless or it's a very wrong stimulus to give because it will tend the pupil to try and, and do some and release something. Uh, most of the time, the person is going to try and release something into, in order to, in fact, correct the defect. We don't want the person to release anything to correct defect. We want the person to start listening to the directions of movements that have first led to this symptom. In this case, the shortening of the chin and the protrusion of uh, the larynx has nothing to do with what the person is doing with the head and neck. It has all to do with the coordination of the movements of the parts of the torso that are dictating how the spine supports the head. If the upper thoracic spine, as I said, is thrown backward, well, you can imagine that uh, the cervical spine has to start from somewhere and somewhere, that somewhere is the upper thoracic spine. So if the upper thoracic spine is sent backward, uh, in order to get the head forward and to free the larynx of the proximity with the insertion of the muscle that suspended to the chin, well, the, the only way is uh, certainly not to try and release anything in the neck, but to try and organize the movement of the parts of the torso so that the, the upper thoracic spine is going to support the head correctly. So, well, uh, the most retarding feature in any teaching work, I don't know, but if you are teaching coordination of movements, if you want to coordinate the directions of different movements, of course, uh, if the pupil reacts too strongly to any indication, any uh, isolated indication, well, the pupil is going to do what is always done, that is being directed by sensory appreciation to release either the chin, the neck, or the shoulders. And anything you're going to point out will be uh, somehow a stimulus to do the wrong thing, which is to concentrate on one detail. Uh, to put oneself into communication with one reasons means to consider the cause. 
the, the, the cause that is the series of movements that result in the wrong symptom that is shown in the video recording. So uh, I've got an example here with a young, a young singer uh, that is having lesson, long distance lesson with me. So I, uh, in order to uh, really get a clear representation of what we are talking about, I asked the student to carry a, a book on top of the front of the thoracic uh, object so that uh, the person at the moment is holding a book and the top of the book is touching the top of the sternum and the lower part of the book, we don't see it, it's behind the arm, but it's, uh, it's resting on the lower part of the sternum. So in that way, watching the video, uh, this student will have a visual representation of what we are discussing. And uh, what we are discussing is the fact that, as you can see, uh, the top of the book is unduly lifted, which is uh, the expression Alexander is using, unduly lifting the front part of the chest. So this gentleman, uh, well, hears that he is uh, uh, described in Alexander's books as the guy that was unduly lifting the front part of the chest. So there is now a sentence, unduly lifting the front part of the chest, and a visual observation. We can connect the two together and start to reason about it. And so there are two images of readjustment. There is image A and image, uh, image sorry, B and image C. And um, uh, they are quite interesting because they show two different uh, reactions and uh, what we can expect. Uh, at first, um, the pupil is not reasoning very clearly because, uh, as you can see, it tries to move the book to a proper position so that uh, the sternum bone is really vertical in, in such a way that the upper thoracic spine is thrown forward and up so that the head is going forward and up. Uh, but I object to this uh, because uh, what is happening in this solution is that for the book to be unduly lifted at the front, we must reason out that uh, the middle torso must be too far forward. If the middle torso is too far forward, it means that the lumbar spine, that is not really shown on this image, but I don't need it to, to be shown. I know that for the book to be inclined this way, the lower part of the rib cage is very far forward. Yes? And so I know that the lumbar spine must be arch. So the person, as exactly as uh, this lady here, we can see that the person is wearing the upper torso further backward than the middle torso. As a result, the lumbar region is really arched. So uh, if the person hears that the, uh, the upper part of the sternum is unduly lifted backward and tries to solve uh, that uh, wrong position with one idea, concentrating on it, the person will try to bring the top of the, the book very far forward. That's what we see here. And uh, uh, when you bring the part, you, you get a result that looks fine. The book now looks much better orientated, so we, we start to think, okay, there is, a, there is a, a vertical sternum, it's what we wanted from the start. Yes, but if you look at the back, you will see that this has been done without any correction of another movement that was the movement of the middle torso forward. As you can see, the lower torso is going further forward. What it means is that when the upper torso direction of movement is forward, well, the lower part of the book direction is also forward. The two movements are going in the same direction. Yes, what, what is the problem? Because we can see that the book is, uh, is, getting, is getting straighter. Is that not the idea? Well, no, it's not because uh, uh, this coordination of movement 
upper torso going in one direction and middle torso going in one direction is exactly what the problem is from the start. So it, it does not matter that we are going forward, that we are going backward. Uh, you can see that the person is moving the top and the lower sternum in the same direction. While in the last picture, and you will see the difference if you look at the there is an, a line of origin that is set on a, an object that is against the table so that we know that between these all these images this object is not moving so we can see that in the first readjustment first reaction to the stimulus of being wrong uh, well we see that the whole torso is going forward in the second it's quite different because we can see that now there are a coordination of directions of movement that is employed and we can see that the lower part of the book is going back and hence the back is going back. Look at how the back was going away, uh, the middle back was going away from the reference line and look at uh, image C and you will find that in fact the middle torso has gone back in space while the upper torso has gone forward in space. This is a much more complex coordination that has to be reasoned. This can be, uh, well, a, an unsinking reaction to the stimulus of knowing that the upper torso is unduly lifted at the front. Uh, this is a much more reasoned reaction where we can see that the pupil not only has, uh, of course, uh, coordinated the movement of the top of the sternum and the bottom of the sternum together, but also uh, the person has gone completely uh, in a new unknown world where instead of doing what is felt as right, uh, the pupil is starting to direct his movement with ideas, with intentions that are contrary to the habitual feeling that the person is experiencing. So uh, in these uh, three images, we see two reactions. Uh, and there is one that is uh, obvious and, and fast. And there is another one that is, uh, well, that requires a lot more inhibition, the capacity to stop and think, and the capacity to continue to stop and think while the readjustment is being done, meaning by that, that the pupil is not stopped by the, f the, f the very, very strange feelings that occur then when as is uh, re-coordinating uh, old series of movements. The, the old series of movements was always the upper torso and the middle torso together. So when you ask the person, for example, to move uh, the middle torso and the lower sternum backward, you will find that the upper sternum is going back with it. Or when you ask the person to send the upper thoracic spine forward and up, uh, the person is going forward also with the middle torso, which in fact results with uh, going forward with the upper torso, but not forward and up, but forward and down. So the great problem is how that we have to solve all the time is how to go forward and up. So uh, Alexander continues uh, and uh, on the same idea and says, I, I begin by pointing out that what we <clears throat> that uh, we expect, in fact, these different things to be wrong. That their being so is not a case for worry or apprehension, seeing that they are assuredly, that they assuredly can be corrected. I draw attention to the obvious fact that a pupil comes to a teacher because there is something wrong. That must be the primary idea. Otherwise, the teacher's help is superfluous. Then, why worry when the defects or failings are discovered and made known to one? In other words, if we have imperfections and defects, we seek help because we are conscious of their existence because we wish to know definitely what they are so that we may have an opportunity to eradicate them. So we, we, we are clearly in the business of eradicating defects. 
there are some teachers they are not eradicating defects they are telling people that they are that they are already perfect well if you have a, a lesson of initial alexander technique you will see that this is not our style it's quite different it's absolutely necessary to uh, for the pupil to realize and uh, realize means that to connect with uh, uh, verbal description and uh, visual representation to connect to what is considered as uh, correct, what is considered as incorrect. But this is not the end. This is, uh, this is just the, 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 a very superficial looking at it. Uh, telling people that they have defects is in fact not really interesting. It's not the telling of people that they have, uh, they have defects. It's uh, telling that uh, these different things that we can see, that we can uh, narrate and describe, are connected. They are connected in their activities. They are not isolated facts that can be treated uh, in isolation. It's impossible to correct something in isolation. If uh, the neck is not free, well, it's because there are a certain number of movements that are incorrectly, well, directed and controlled by the pupil. It's, I don't see a point of telling a person you're pulling down. If you don't explain uh, def with definite and uh, very explicit demonstration that um, how this pulling down is done. Uh, pulling down will mean nothing for the person. How do you stop pulling down if you don't understand which movements are coordinated to create the pulling down? And so um, the help of the, tu the teacher is superfluous if the teacher is not explaining how the defects connect together. And uh, the teacher's help can be devastatingly uh, wrong if the teacher does not do his job of teaching and just, well, does a job of uh, uh, making the pupil experience something. Uh, I, have, uh, um, I have these pictures where we see that uh, objectively I can tell that Alexander is uh, reorienting the movements of the middle and upper torso. It's absolutely obvious that his fingers are parallel to each other, that uh, uh, <coughs> he is creating a condition for the upper thoracic spine to be moving forward and up. And as a result, the neck is moving forward and up. As you can see, the gentleman is starting to have his chin just in front of uh, the front of his torso. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at a different Alexander teacher, uh, the next generation, and uh, curiously, something is, uh, is amiss. It's, uh, it's uh, the new modern Alexander technique, and in the modern Alexander technique, uh, there is this idea that when the neck is free, everything is going to, uh, to, to come into place. Uh, the neck free, head forward and up is like a, a sort of uh, area where the teacher is going to organize something and as a result, uh, with the help of the teacher, the pupil is going to be seen to move up and down without effort. Well, it's quite strange because uh, uh, if you compare the two images, all the defects of the movements of the torso are still uh, clearly uh, apparent in the attitude of that teacher, because I know that this gentleman was a teacher, he was not a pupil, and uh, I, I find this very, very strange. Uh, how could you have Alexander organizing the movement of the torso and uh, someone else organizing the movement in the neck and head, and how could this lead to the same conclusion? That is, the capacity for the pupil to organize his own movement, his own coordination, in order to improve his functioning. Very, very strange. So, um, <coughs> imperfections and defects are not isolated anomalies to be treated with a magic release button. 
the, this, uh, this concept of the uh, primary control has come to something absolutely insane where it is thought that the teacher with his hands is going to trigger some uh, fantastic device that is going to solve all the pupil's problem without the pupil being uh, of course aware of what's going on and without uh, the pupil knowing how to replicate the same uh, solution. So it is possible placing the hands on people to make them feel extraordinary light, extraordinary, uh, uh, I don't know, different, but uh, it's just a trick. The, the point is not there. The point is how do you help the pupil to uh, consciously readjust or consciously react to stimulus, to stimuli that are telling, that are showing that things are wrong and uh, we are not planning for the for pupil to be right we are planning for pupil to understand what it is to in fact conceive a stimulus uh, that is wrong and uh, react to it and we don't want the pupil to react immediately by trying to find either the magic release button the pr sort of direction of the primary control when this concept of direction of primary control is uh, completely um, separated from the correct directions of the, the antagonistic movements of the different parts of the torso. <coughs> and uh, this uh, idea of right and wrong uh, brings, us to, uh, the, uh, brings us back to the idea of model. Uh, it's absolutely clear that uh, for something to be conceived as wrong, you must have an idea of something is right. And we are not discussing here uh, that tension is wrong and uh, release is right. We are really discussing what is the coordination of the movement that is going to produce an expansion of the different parts of the torso. And so uh, we need a model. We need to know what it is we are constructing. What is the what? What do we mean by lengthening, expanding the torso? And so, uh, I, I just um, repeated what Del Sart was uh, was saying that he he did not invent the model. He took the model from the from the Greek. Uh, from the Greek model. The Greek statues before 300 BC were showing things that are much difficult to see. And so uh, nowadays, when you look at modern modern people, not even Alexander teachers, what you see is, uh, is something where the, the sternum bone is absolutely vertical. It's ob uh, obvious. And that uh, in this case, we can say that, uh, of course, uh, the top of the sternum and the lower part of the sternum are exactly in line with the the front frontal part of the torso. So how do I define the frontal part of the torso? The frontal part of the torso is mostly uh, defined by a sort of a triangle. You can get the, the uh, two iliac protuberances, the front of the pelvic bone that are so easy to find, the anterior superior iliac crest. You make a line and then you get to, to find the lower sternum bone. This will give you a triangle, a plane, a two-dimensional plane. And so you can start uh, thinking of directing movements or uh, what you see here, directing spots on bony parts according to an orthogonal system where you have uh, forward and forward is 90 degree to the line of the iliacs and 90 degree to the plane, to the frontal plane of the torso. What is up? up is 90 degree to the line of the iliacs and parallel to the frontal plane of the torso. And so you, you get to understand that uh, the person himself is going to start to be able to, uh, well, combine the direction of different bony parts of the torso. And we want to combine these different parts of the torso to create a, to, to come as near as possible to a model. So uh, here I used uh, some, some wooden rulers. They are all of the same length and they explain exactly what is meant by this uh, concept of uh, a vertical line of reference. 
you can see that uh, uh, the torso is organized here and expanding not because the ribs are expanding and moving. No, no, it's not at all the point. Uh, the expansion is uh, created by the new organization of the movements, of the horizontal movements, if you want, of the different parts of the torso. We can see that in, in going forward and taking a step, it's possible to imagine that the step is going to be uh, reasoned out or guided by a geometrical representation that has nothing to do with what the person feels. Most of the time, if you try to set yourself in front of a vertical wall with different rulers of the same length, we, you will find that your habitual way of standing with one foot forward, one foot back, never gives uh, contact with all the rulers at the same time. You have to really go against your feelings to get the middle torso sufficiently far back so that you can touch with the upper torso against the wall. Uh, let's imagine uh, if you were to play uh, this game with uh, a person that is habitually holding herself in this way, you can imagine that there is no way the person can have the, the four rulers suspended in, in, in space. So the right and wrong uh, is not uh, some appreciation of the teacher that consider that, well, you look tight, or that would say that you, um, you're pulling down or, or anything like this. No, no, it's uh, uh, where do we want to go and how to, to get there. This is, uh, this is much more what we, what we discussed during your lessons of uh, initial Alexander technique. And uh, the person will start to use these tools because we, you, what you're looking at at the moment are tools. That is a line that you can start to conceive where is, uh, uh, for example, the top of the sternum relatively to the ankle is not something you can feel ever. Yes, but uh, nonetheless, you can start to use these tools in order to create uh, uh, absolutely new coordination of movements in activity, I mean, dynamic movements. So, um, when Alexander finishes the sentence, he says, he says uh, common sense dictates that we should find a teacher who can detect these defects and diagnose their cause. And when this is done, the pupil has much to ease his mind, much to bring him real satisfaction when the teacher can assure him of their eradication and a change mental attitude should immediately follow. But many people are so out of communication with their reason that it needs days of re-education to establish a satisfactory working basis. So, um, I have some comments to make on this last part of the sentence. Um, so, of course, common sense dictates that we should find a teacher who can detect these defects and diagnose their cause. Yes, what is important here is the, the diagnosis of the cause because uh, we are not into eradi eradicating defects one after the other. This will never work. If you eradicate one defect without changing the overall working balance between the, old, the other movements, what is going to happen is that you are going to maybe hide one defect, but you are going to throw the whole working balance of the regs in disarray, and it's going to be worse than before. So, um, diagnosing the cause of the defects is much more important than uh, pointing to defects. What is important is that what, uh, we should find a teacher that can relate the defects together to a common cause, which is the incorrect direction of the different movements of the parts of the mechanism. That is what is important. That is what I am I'm fighting for. It's uh, this idea that when I uh, point to a defect during a gesture, during a procedure, the defect in itself is not important. What is important is how is this defect related to the coordination, the habitual coordination of the movement, how the person is going to be able to make a change. And um, 
the change mental attitude, which is instead of concentrating on each defect, oh dear, I feel a tension here, I will release, or oh, I feel a lack of activity there, I will activate. This is, this is not the uh, reason attitude. This is reacting to a stimulus immediately. So uh, the change mental attitude is the capacity that comes with reasoning of inhibiting. You, okay, you hear that there is a defect, but you, are, you hear also how this defect is connected with other defects with the same cause. Well, and you start to well, imagine directions of movements for, to change the cause. And um, um, when Alexander said that many people are out of communication with their reason, that it needs days to, of re-education to establish a satisfactory working basis, I'm, I'm a bit uh, annoyed. Uh, of course, we are, uh, we are proposing a completely new field. So how do you want people to start to reason in a completely new field without no lead, without no ways to organize their reasoning? I think it's a bit easy to say something like this. It's uh, our job as uh, teachers is um, obviously uh, to bring the, the people to realize that there is a new field of investigation that we call conscious guidance and control, which is conscious coordination of different movements at the same time, and uh, discover uh, all the means that are possible to help them reason out. Because uh, saying that people are not reasoning, it's like you, you, you throw a, a mathematical problem to a person that has never heard that language. Of course, at first, how do you want the person to reason out or to, to have a correct attitude? It's not possible. So uh, it, it's um, a satisfactory working basis has to be constructed between the teacher and the student. And uh, at first, it's obvious that it's the teacher part that is in, in question, not the pupil. Uh, saying that pupils are out of communication with their reason is not helping in any way. The idea is to give them the tools and uh, the words necessary in order to start to reason out these things and to start to establish the connection between the intention the person can have in mind and uh, the movement that are seen resulting from it. So this is uh, my idea for uh, a new year. Any, any question on your side? Yes. So another, another way of describing this phrase, being in communication with reason would be thinking in relations. So it, rather, so when you get, so someone tells you the, there's the wrong defect, the person's habit, most people's habit will be to focus on the defect, the feeling of that area probably that was mentioned. And then that sets and train a whole motion of other thoughts, uh, other feelings and sensations and, and thoughts. But what he's saying is to be in communication and reason is to me, and you're saying, is to start thinking about more than one thing at once and the relations between them and what causes, what is the cause, what's the effect and how things are related to one another. And by doing this, you're already taken out of the, you're not paying attention to the feeling anymore. And you can only obviously feel one or two things at a time. You can't feel all of them. So rather than have the person so like they're told that they're wrong so rather than then they if they focus on the feeling then they'll try and describe they'll maybe justify what happened they'll try and describe the feeling and they'll come up with a story about why this might be the case which isn't really useful at all it's easier just it's better just to uh figure out what's causing as you say cause, what's the cause of the problem that uh, of all of the defects and then you can just let the feelings take care of themselves later yeah uh, because you're you're now um, comparing, you know, how, when one movement over here, how that affects another movement over there, and you're you're in a different realm now, rather than uh, than in the feelings. So for the person is, you're not going to take it offensively or be um, too stimulated to do any work when you're told you're wrong because you're immediately thinking about how to solve the problem. Yeah, you're you're no, it's not a thing about you're wrong. It's something that needs changed. That's correct. And um, very often it needs um, a bit of time because uh, it, 
it is necessary for the person to create a few different experiments where the subject herself is, uh, is directing different movements and uh, observing the result in video and, and seeing that there is a connection between the intentions of movement she may produce in her mind and uh, the gesture and the outcome of the gesture which is the position and so the person will start to to have a, a, a well an understanding of the steps that is uh, understanding uh, the connection between the movements and the posture uh, understanding how many intentions she needs to have uh, following these these intentions in practice that is you have intention it's a good thing but uh, n n nothing says that when you're going to uh, engage into an experiment where you want these intention to take effect uh, at first you have to check whether they are taking effect or not and uh, it's not something that uh, takes time we are not waiting for years for a person to to put effect and uh, follow her intention we don't know we want we want to create experiments straight away where the person is uh, well no matter what uh, performing the action that have been intended intended in the first place and so uh, e even if this leads to incorrect position incorrect movements that are appearing behind it we, we that is exactly the point we want the person to start uh, realizing that uh, uh, she has a say in how uh, the different parts are moving it's, it's not uh, you know i've got uh, the other day uh, I, I started giving lessons to a teacher and uh, she said to me, oh, no, no, this, um, uh, this position of the neck, uh, in, in, for me, it's a condition. I've been diagnosed. I've been diagnosed with a straight, uh, straight upper neck. Well, she, what, what she was uh, telling me is that uh, because it's diagnosed, she can do anything about it. It was like something that was uh, imposed on her. It, well, I, I refuse totally this idea. I say, I said to her, the straight neck is just the result of a certain coordination of the movement. It's not a condition. It's a, it's a functional problem. And uh, my job as a teacher is to demonstrate to you that you can uh, organize different movements that are going to lead to a different result, a different position, a different posture. And um, uh, we cannot change the posture in itself, but we can change the movements. If we change the movements, oh, you will discover that suddenly the posture has evaporated, that the condition is not there anymore. But um, I mention this because um, uh, very often in many different areas, not only of position, but many people uh, are so disconnected with these kinds of reasoning that we are proposing that they imagine that uh, that's it. They, this is how they are. This is how they react. This is part of their uh, fate or personality. It's very... So we want to really dynamite these kinds of concept. We want to think, no, 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 you, you, have, uh, you have some say in this. You can uh, start using your mind in order to reason out movement and in order to transform intentions into actions. This is the, this is the, the purpose of these lessons. This is what these lessons are for. And to go back to when someone's... Um been told that they're doing something wrong during a lesson and they maybe you know take it uh, emotional about it uh what they can watch on video of what they did while they were thinking about the feeling of the thing that was wrong and they'll see there's another set of movements associated with that yeah so it which can also be worked with so you can start reasoning about okay when i did that i did all these i set in to train a set of motions uh, a set of movements that I didn't realize I was doing until now you're using video. So you can start to, if you can see the different, if you can see the different parts and how they're moving in relation to one another, then the next stage is you can change them. Otherwise you're just, uh, it's just guesswork with your feelings. Yes, but uh, once again, Alexander says that common sense dictates that you should find a teacher who can detect these defects and relate them because um, 
the first time when the person is going to watch the video and hear the, that uh, there is a, a symptom or something wrong, um, the person will not be in capacity to see the defects. So that's our job as teachers to, in fact, uh, start to, well, stop the image and think, okay, we see the defect, okay, you see the defects, fine. But you are, we are not there to concentrate on the defects. Look just uh, the seconds before at which movements you are making, which movements of the different part are occurring, and at these movements, anything to do with the defect we see. And the person will, will start to look at it and at first see very little and then you have to decompose, you have to present. Uh, for example, I do very often images after images so that the person can see how, for example, the, uh, the middle torso is moving during the, the whole movement. So instead of uh, we discuss uh, three seconds and we take, I don't know, 20 pictures out of these three seconds so that the person can see very slowly what are the movements that are appearing and uh, because the person has uh, this capacity to link up ideas uh, the person will start to uh, you know like a film is an animation of different different static pictures well the person can start to uh, use the same trick in our mind and think okay so i see the middle torso accelerating very fast forward while the upper torso is not well, this is sufficient to create the, this impression or this uh, posture with the top of the sternum unduly lifted at the front. So the cause of the, of the unduly lifted sternum is the speed I am giving to the different parts during these three seconds. And so now we come into the question, is it possible to affect the speed of the movement of the different bony parts during these three seconds? then suddenly the person has something uh, to work with that uh, uh, then she will experiment with. Uh, let's, let's make another experiment. Let's start and let's count to three to film these two seconds and see what is happening during. And there uh, is uh, the, uh, one of the, the tools of pedagogy that we use in, in this uh, experimental teaching. Oh, I cannot uh, hear you. Sorry, yeah. and you, you also touched upon a, it's quite a modern idea. I think that the that the pupil is to be the the teachers to act as if they're not doing anything wrong, that they're just that they're already perfect the way they are. So, in which case, why would they be coming to somebody for help? So it's it's expected that you're learning a new discipline. It's something you haven't learned before. You're bound to not be able to do it the first time, and it's a strange approach for people to pretend that the people that there's nothing wrong with people and that everyone's just the same and everyone's perfect the way they are because how are you going to learn anything it's... yes because um, th there are many somatic teachers that are uh, thinking that they bring comfort that what they need to bring is comfort to their pupil they need to to have them feel nice and feel happy in order to learn something that's the the main basic idea well learning a new thing is uh is reaching out of one condition it's uh it's stepping out of the comfort zone and uh, exploring where you don't know how to to organize and do things so it's uh, i'm not teaching comfort at all i don't think you are either we we are really teachers a teacher doesn't care for comfort he doesn't care for uh, comforting people, you know. Uh, I am not healing people, ever. No, I am just uh, giving people tools they can use and they are most of the time reasoning tools and uh, they can use in order to, well, explore away from their comfort zone. They, so it's exactly the opposite of a somatic teacher, if you want. They are really something to be learned and not something to receive. I do not give anything. I ask pe people to work with uh, complex uh, structures and uh, uh, to learn to well direct these complex structures in activity. So it's it's uh, it's a totally different uh, conception of the work as teachers. I understand that. Excellent. Okay. Brilliant. Um, for people watching, you will find a link to Jondo underneath. You can book a lesson with them and get out of your comfort zone. And we'll see you in the next video.
Tack så mycket. Bye. Bye.